Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. It's my privilege to welcome you to this series on science from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, science, history, and faith in Islam. Inshallah, because of the Mawri prayers, next week we'll start at uh, 7.40 exactly and be done in about 50 minutes thereafter. Last week, there was a question from one of the ladies about scientists, women scientists in Islam. I did some research into it, and what I found was that while there are a large number of ladies who have made a contribution to the sciences of hadith and fiqh, and some whose names show up in the mathematical and physical sciences, there weren't that many in the physical and the mathematical sciences. So we have to accept the fact that they're not there. And we can ask ourselves why it was that it was so. Was it culture? Was it the difficulty for women to travel and study under a well-known sheikh, what was it? What, well, the reason was, I found one name, al Italia of Syria in the 10th century. She was a well-known mathematician who worked on astrolobes. You also find some names in calligraphy. So if you want to classify calligraphy as a science, which it is, because it involves both physical exertion as well as mathematical ability to write the way calligraphers do. If you classify it as a mathematical science, then yes, you find them in the area of calligraphy also. That's what I found. Today's presentation, inshallah, is about the fall of Spain, a subject that interests so many Muslims in particular, and people in general. What we'll do is to first ask ourselves, what is the law of civilization? What is it that enables a large number of people to work together to create a civilization? And what is it that, that causes these people to fall apart and that effort to go to naught? Civilizations arise and civilizations fall. A large number of attempts have been made to enunciate the principle of the laws of civilization. Our approach is the Quranic approach. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in the Quran, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Wal Asr, Inna Linsana la fi khust, Illa Ladina Amanu, Wa Amanu Salihat, Wa Tawasaw bil Haq, Wa Tawasaw bil Saw. That is the law of civilization, or at least. It teaches us when it is that humankind does not lose, does not slip on the ladder of civilization. We will look at the well-known theories of the rise and fall of civilization. Then I'll enunciate my own principle based upon the ayah that I have just recited, the rise and fall of civilization. The first one, to consider the issue, the grand schema of how civilizations come together and fall apart, was the father of history, which was Ibn Khaldun, who lived in the latter part of the 14th century. And historians have applied his analysis to the rise and fall of dynasties. Basically, Ibn Khaldun postulates that civilizations are held together because of asabiya. Asabiya is tribal cohesion. And he found that through his observations in plenty amongst the desert nomads, the people of the mountains, the people who wander around. Uh, these are the qualities of chivalry, of um, allegiance to a leader, courage, forgiveness, 
charity. These are qualities that hold the people together. And contrary to those qualities, when you have qualities in people that are cheating, lying, uh, deception, these are qualities he found in city dwellers. And he says in his Muhaddama, what happens is that people, when they start building a civilization, they do so on the basis of asabiya. So when they build a civilization, they move into the valleys and overcome a settled civilization which has lost those qualities because it has become addicted to the ease of living in the cities. Then over time, the people who have come into the valleys themselves become city dwellers and they lose those virtues, those qualities that in the first place enable them to overcome the valley dwellers or the city dwellers and they go through the process of fall. The rise because of the qualities of Asabiya, the fall because they lose the qualities of Asabiya. Uh, there are many problems with the theory of Ibn Khaldun. One is that it does not make an allowance for a people to renew themselves from within. When a civilization settles down and becomes a city-based civilization, must it necessarily, necessarily go through the process of losing the civilization? Must it necessarily regress? Because when you study so many other civilizations, including Islamic civilization, it was a city-based civilization. Most of the achievements of Islamic civilization took place in cities like Baghdad and Khartaba and Cairo and Sijil Masa and so on. But the biggest problem we have with the theory of Asabiyah is that Islam is against Asabiyah. Islam negates the principles of dividing people on the basis of race, on the basis of nationality, color, except on the basis of virtue and on the basis of righteousness. In its place, Islam tries to build a civilization enjoining what is right, forbidding what is evil, and believing in Allah. Kuntum khaira ummatin nas bil ma'ruf wa So Islam is against asabiyah. So when you adopt the theory of rise and fall of civilizations enunciated by Ibn Khaldun in his Muhaddama, you run into an impasse. And when you try to apply it to a situation like Spain, there are always question marks there. Another theory that is uh, well known to people is that of Toynbee. Toynbee, well known uh, the philosopher, who lived in the latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, his postulate is based upon challenge and response. He says people rise to a higher level when they're faced with a challenge, they work together. And when the challenge disappears, they come apart. And he illustrates that by giving the examples all the way from the pre-Roman era to modern times. But the problem with that theory is that where does the challenge come from? Uh, where does the response come from? And is it necessary for a civilization to have a challenge for it to rise up to a higher level and build a civilization? Is it not possible for a civilization to come together on the basis something other than a challenge? Therefore, even though these theories are powerful theories and they can be applied with some manipulation of data, and one can derive enormous wisdoms using these theories. Each one of them leads to an impasse. Each one of them leads to some questions. Therefore, I postulated based upon the study of the Quran. It's the Quranic approach. That a civilization comes together because of faith. Faith is the basis and the driver of a civilization. 
When there's faith, people rise up to a higher level and achieve uncommon results. When there's no faith, a civilization falls apart. Faith is what enables people to overcome difficulties. Faith is what enables a people to create great works of art and architecture and to overcome their adversaries. Islamic civilization is a faith-based civilization. Indeed, it can be said that most of the great civilizations, such as the Christian civilization, if you want to uh, apply to the Christian civilization, or portions of Hindu civilization, or the Buddhist civilization, or the Chinese civilization, based upon some kind of faith, namely a transcendental idea to which people subscribe and are willing to sacrifice their own egos in order to achieve that transcendental goal, that transcendental faith that we have. Islam is a faith-based civilization. If you study the ayah that I recited, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, except those who have certainty of faith. Amanu means not just faith, but certainty of faith. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Backed up by righteous action, good deeds. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats twice, Tawasa. That's very important, working together. If people work together, they achieve uncommon results. When they don't work together, they fall apart. And that we can apply in ordinary organizations, such as in a company, or it can apply to a community of believers, or it can apply to nations or civilizations. And we'll apply to the case, specific case of Spain in this case. And in order for us to do so, I'll also share with you another law, which is the law of consolidation. In order for political consolidation or military consolidation, it is necessary that the means of offense be greater than the means of defense. I repeat, the means of offense have to be greater than the means of defense. Any empire that has come together, you apply it, you'll find them. But then in order for an empire to be built, or a civilization to come together, or a large number of people to overcome their adversaries, in order for the means of offense to be greater than the means of defense, you need energy. What kind of energy are we talking about? We are talking about money. Money is also a prime mover in human affairs. And historically, and I'm just summarizing the results of many, many years of research, Summarily, people obtain wealth only by two means. One is through trade, that is, you grow something, trade it, and everyone prospers. That's the peaceful means. But more, common, more commonly, very often, people get it through loot. They wage war, go to somebody else's territory, take their wealth, bring it back, and build the empire. So the means of offense must be greater. And for that, you need money. And for money, you need trade or you need the means of offense. You can apply it to modern day empires too. How was the British Empire held together? How is the American Empire held together? You can apply it. These are the laws of civilization. Now, again, to go back to Spain, we must understand the context. We must understand the mechanisms by which people come together and they come apart. We said faith is what holds a civilization together. Our faith of Islam is like a humongous tree, a giant tree, which has many branches. And what we'll do very briefly is to look at the many branches and how, whether we call them branches or fissures or cracks in a monolithic structure, how those cracks sometimes have been used by outsiders and internally also to 
rent asunder the structure, the monolithic structure of Islam. Yet another insight that I share with you is the following. Civilizations very seldom disappear because of external threats. Civilizations come apart internally. They lose their cohesion internally, and then somebody from the outside comes in and delivers a coup de grace, a grace, an invader. But initially, it is implosion. Whether you study the Mughal Empire, or the Ottoman Empire, or the Greek Empire, or the Roman Empire, the British Empire, of course, was, was a little bit different because of the Second World War. Even what is happening in America today. Civilizations come apart internally. Something happens to people internally. It is not just faith, but the application of faith, the ethics that is derived from faith that holds the people together. Faith generates ethics. What is ethics? For instance, contract. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs us so many places, says when you give your word, honor your word. Starting with your word to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your word to other people. There are at least seven places that I can recall right now wherein the emphasis has been placed upon the keeping of the word. That is contract. There is emphasis upon chivalry. There is emphasis upon righteousness, truth, honesty, integrity, humility. These are virtues. These are good characteristics. When you, for instance, lose your humility, you become haughty. Haughtiness does not become a human being. It is a virtue only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kubr goes with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his kibriya. But kubr in a human being brings him down. Pride belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is becoming of his name. But pride in a human being brings him down. And then the guidance that divine edict offers us in terms of how to relate to each other. When we stay with these injunctions, the guidance, we prosper. When we violate those guidance, we go off the road, fall off the cliff somewhere. Sometimes we break our leg, sometimes we die. So it is faith as well as what is derived from faith. Now let's look at the structure of Islam. We studied the first major crack immediately after the passing of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm relating this to lay a good background to understand how it is that Spain came apart. And that's also applicable today. You have to ask us, what is happening today in the Islamic world? The Shia Sunni split as a result as a consequence of the process of selection of the first Khalifa and the differences that arose the first day as to the methodology as well as the person who was elected, the Shia Sunni split. But that is like a giant crack. And it's like earthquakes. You need, you, we live in earthquake zones in California. We have a giant earthquake. Then we have little earthquakes taken off from the major fault line. The major fault line is Shia Sunni. But then if we go into the Shia side of the equation and the Sunni side of the equation, we similarly find other cracks. Now in the, let's talk about the Shia side and then we'll talk a little bit about the Sunni side as applied to the Maghrib. What I will do at this stage, since I use the word Maghrib, is important for us to understand the topology of the Maghrib, because that helps us understand the history of the Maghrib. It is called al -Aqsa. The Maghrib consists of the following countries. Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, parts of Libya, down to Mauritania, and then the Atlas Mountains that run through the ridge of uh, um, hills in both Morocco and uh, Algeria, they jet into Spain. Southern Spain is a continuation of the hills of uh, the Atlas Mountains. It is very hilly, all the way into the Pyrenees Mountains. So 
the word al-Aqsa or the Maghrib, Maghrib al-Aqsa, applies to Spain, that's the Iberian Peninsula, which includes Spain and Portugal, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, parts of Libya, down to Mauritania. The hinge for the Maghrib is Morocco. So if you understand the history of Morocco, you understand something of the history of Spain, and understand something of the history of Algeria, all the way down to the Sahara Desert. Although the center of gravity now has moved somewhat towards Algeria because of the population. So that is the Maghrib, and is isolated. To the north, the Pyrenees Mountains, this block of countries is separated from Europe proper, from, Spain, from uh, France, by the Pyrenees Mountains. To the south, you have the Sahara Desert. To the east, you have a continuation of the Libyan Desert. You know, some of the wars, the battles that were fought during the Second World War, the El Alamein and so on, you have read about them. There's a big desert. So this vast area is isolated from the rest of Eurasia, and therefore it has had to chart out its own course in history by itself, with some interaction. Similar to how it was that Indonesia and Malaysia, for instance, that had to chart out, chart out their own course, independent to a large extent of the political happenings in the rest of the Islamic world. I hope you're still with me. That's the geographic entity when we say Maghrib. So whatever happened in Maghrib was basically self-contained. And some of the movements that take place, some of the fissures that we see in the body politics of Islam in the Maghrib, you do not see in the eastern part of the Islamic world. So coming back to the Shia Sunni split, one of the major subdivisions of the Shias took place after the sixth Imam, Imam Ismail, who was after Imam Jafar al Sadiq. He died even when Imam Jafar al Sadiq was alive, and therefore Imam Jafar al Sadiq nominated Muta Qasim as the Imam. Some of the Shias accepted the Imamate of Musa Qasim. Some said, no, we're not going to accept it. We accept only the Imamate of Imam Ismail. Those who accepted the Imamate of Islam, uh, Imam Ismail are called the Ismailis, the Aghahanis today, for instance, in India and Pakistan. Very, very influential people. And the previous Aghahan, for instance, is buried in, uh, in, uh, in Upper Egypt. We visited his grave at one time. So the Aghahanis, or the Ismailis, are a sub-branch of the Shias. They are called the Seveners. The major branch of the Shias, they are called the Tovers, because they believe in twelve imams. They are called the Ithna Ashari. That's the uh, Shia uh, fiqh that is followed in Iran at the present time. And then you have sub-sub-branches. I will come to that. What happened was, in the 8th century, in the Maghrib, you see, since it was comparatively isolated from the rest of the Islamic world, first the uh, schisms that we see in the eastern part of the Islamic world found their place in the, in the West. The Fatimids, which is the Ismailis, they're also called the Fatimids because they derive or they claim their origin, lineage, through Hazrat Fatima al Zahra and Hazrat Ali Radal An. The Fatimids rose up towards the middle of the 9th century and they claimed that the Imamat and the Khilafat rightfully belonged to them. Many people accepted their position because there was tension between the Arab city dwellers and the mountainous people who were the uh, who lived in the Atlas Mountains, the Berbers. That's another thing to remember about the West. There was always a state of tension between the sweet city dwellers who were the Arabs and the mountain dwellers who were the Berbers. And then south of the main population centers, you have the Sinhajas. 
That's the pasture land. They were the um, people who kept the herds all the way into the Sahara. So you have a triangle between the city dwellers, the Arabs, the Berbers, and the Sinhajas. And the tension between these three very often determined to a large extent what was happening in the Maghrib. So the Fatimids attracted a large number of people to their point of view. To make the presentation brief, what happened in the middle of the century was that the second uh, Imam of the, of the Fatimids, the Fatimid dynasty, I should say, he was challenged by the Sunnis. He lost out and was killed in battle. To take revenge upon what had happened, the third Khalifa, Fatimid Khalifa, he gathered together with the help of the Sinhajas, raised all the area from what is today Libya to the Atlantic Ocean. This is a very important event, completely decimated. It's like, for instance, uh, Ger General Sherman during the Civil War, American Civil War, on his march towards Atlanta created a vast swath of territory where everything was devastated, burned. Now, this dislocation of the population in turn destroyed the cohesiveness that existed in the Maghrib. So add to it, add to the tensions that you see between the city dwellers, the mountain dwellers, and the pastures, the fact that you have this dislocation taking place, and you have the ingredients ripe for a revolution. There indeed was a revolution in the 10th century, beginning of the 11th century. I will come to that. It was the, the uh, Murabitun revolution. But before I go there, the Fatimids were successful in consolidating their position throughout North Africa. Then they moved towards Egypt conquered Egypt in the middle of the 10th century, established the city of al Qahira al Cairo. They were the ones who founded it up, up until the time. It was called Husta. Qahira was founded by the Fatimids in the year 969. The same year, more or less, when they established the Al-Azhar University. They also tried to conquer Spain. But Spain was ruled by the Umayyads, who were Sunnis. And the Umayyads, looking south to, the, to the, the territories of North Africa, they saw that it was taken over by the Shiite branch of Islam. So they, the Spaniards, through their Khalifa, which was Abdurrahman III, declared themselves the, the Khalifas for all, all Muslims. So it works in the 10th century now, you have three centers of Khilafat. One, the Fatimids. I hope you still can have it's going kind of fast because a lot of things are taking place. What I'm trying to communicate is that one of the keys to the fall of Spain is to be found in the schisms, the internal schisms within Islam. One of the, one of the keys. That's I'm try, trying to give you a summary of it. So in the 10th century, you have three centers of Khilafat. One based in Khartaba, which is in Spain. Abdurrahman III, he said, I'm the Khalifa. One based in Cairo. al muiz was the most powerful of the Khalifas of the, of the uh, Fatimids. And one based in Baghdad. Meanwhile, in Baghdad, also things are happening, very briefly. What was happening in Baghdad, as we talked earlier, the rise of the Turks who was first hired to balance off one branch of the uh, Arab tribes with some other Arab tribes. The Turks were first uh, uh, introduced into the armed forces. And then they had better ideas. They became kingmakers. So you have the rise of the Turks, and at the same time, the influence, Shia influence, in southern Iraq. For a while there, the Buyuds, who were the dwellers, managed to even capture Baghdad. This is all happening about the same time. And the Turks came in, they became the champions of the Sunni Abbasids, managed to contain the Shia Buyids, and re-establish the hold of the Abbasid Khilafat in Baghdad. 
So now, you look at the Islamic world now. You have the eastern part of the Islamic world. You walk from Lahore, for instance. Lahore, Afghanistan, Central Asia, most of Iran, all the way up to the Euphrates River, you have the hold or the power of the Turks. Then you have in southern Iraq the power of the Buyuds who are competing with the Turks for control of Baghdad. Then you have the Fatimids who are in control of North Africa, Hejaz, including Mecca and Medina, and Syria. And then you have Spain, which is controlled by the Sunnis, who are the Umayyads. Now Spain was a powerful emirate. They were able to hold out the Fatimid challenges for a long time. Nonetheless, there were further schisms. Even amongst the Ismailis, there were further schisms. There was a branch who were called the, uh, the uh, I'll come to the name. They were the uh, um, the name will escape in my mind, but uh, I'll come to it. Now, these people were dissatisfied with the Fatimids because the Fatimids initially tried to convert the Sunnis to the establishment of al Azhar University, which was the propaganda center initially. They were unsuccessful. Therefore, they worked out a modest operandi, working relationship with the Sunnis. But Karamas, this, they, were, they were called the Karamatians. The Karamatians were a split branch of the Ismailis. They were extremists. These Karamatians, they said, we don't want to work with the Sunnis at all. They rose up from southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. In the latter part of the 10th century, they sacked Damascus. Then, in the early part of the 11th century, they sacked Mecca. They took the, the Hijra Aswad, the black stone in the Kaaba. If, uh, I believe it's the year 1030 and carried off to Bahrain. And there, the black stone stayed for 20 years. It was not there in Mecca for 20 years until it was brought back by the combined efforts of the Fatimid Khalifa and the Khalifa in Baghdad. They went on rampage. They would attack caravans, Hajj caravans, kill men, women, and children. They were extremists all the way through. So you see these cleavages cracks, just like the earthquake falls in, in Los Angeles, which allowed outsiders to come in. Who are the outsiders in here, if I may use the term outsiders? The Christians who had lost out Spain had never given up the idea of reconquering Spain. Most people, when they think of the Crusades, they're focused on Jerusalem, and rightfully so. So Jerusalem, Jerusalem. But many of the battles, indeed most of the battles that were fought during the Crusades were fought on the Iberian Peninsula in Spain. It was Spain that saw a contest of arms between the Muslims and the Christians for 500 years. Starting with the 11th century all the way up to 1492. In the 11th century, I refer to the Murabidin revolution. Inshallah, we'll cover it another time as to the reasons for the revolution and what it achieved. By the time Spain, the Spaniards, most of whom had accepted Islam, about 60% of Spain had become Islam by the middle of the 10th century and had achieved a very high level of civilization, they had become city dwellers and had lost the virtues that had brought them to Iberian Peninsula in the first place. There was a time the beginning of the 8th century when Tariq, when he crossed the Straits of Gibraltar, he burned his ships and he said to his people, either you move forward or you perish. Move forward in the name of God or you perish. But now by this time, the Spaniards had become pleasure lovers. More into art and wine and song and those kinds of things. In the year 1032, the Spanish emirate or the Khilafat broke up. When it broke up, it broke up into seven or eight principalities. Zaragoza, Toledo, 
Kartava, Seville, Granada, each one of them. And this was an opportunity for the Christians up in the north in, who were waiting for an opportunity to play one against the other and gradually they went on the offensive. As early as the middle of the 11th century, way before the onset of the Crusades in Eastern Mediterranean for Jerusalem, Toledo, the old capital of Spain, was lost, 1086, major event in global history. If you want to remember the dates in the histories that I'm mentioning, 1086 was the fall of Toledo, 1236 was the fall of Kartaba, 1248 was the fall of Sevilla or Seville, 1492 the fall of Granada. These are very important dates. So you have a situation now in Spain wherein you have a large number of principalities who are divided on the basis of tribe. See, with Tawassal bil Haq, Tawassal working together. They were not working together. They were, it was a free for all. Sometimes the Christians who work with the Muslims, the Muslims would cross over all over the place. The Christians were also fighting amongst themselves. It was a free for all. This, that lasted for almost a uh, hundred years. But the power situation in Eurasia had shifted in, the, in a counterclockwise direction, by which I mean the following. In this period, if you look at what was happening in the West Asian area, the Turks were advancing towards Constantinople. I mentioned to you in 1072, the, the Turks defeated the Byzantines, and that was the Battle of Manziker, a major battle in world history that enabled the Turks to move towards Constantinople and into Eastern Europe. 1086 was the fall of Toledo. Put this in juxtaposition. Counterclockwise, because the Turks were advancing from the direction of Anatolia into Eastern Europe, whereas the Christians were advancing south through Spain to the conquest of one principality after the other. In the year 997, most people think of the Crusades starting in 1096. Actually, it was declared in 997 by the Pope. 997, a crusade was declared by the Pope. And that was initially focused on the Iberian Peninsula, resulted in the conquest, reconquest of Toledo in central Spain. If you look at the map of Spain, Toledo right smack in the center, the heart of Spain. And then came the Murabitun from the south, tried to contain the Christians for a while. They were successful. But they too fell apart because, as I mentioned earlier, there was always a state of tension between the dwellers, city dwellers for the Arabs, and the people of the mountains, the, the uh, Berbers, the Berbers, and sometimes the Sinhajas got into the fray. The Berbers were, the, <coughs> were sometimes mistreated because what happens to city dwellers is that they become haughty. You accumulate wealth, you accumulate culture. It happens today too. Hillbillies walking in, oh, I look down, he doesn't know how to eat. He drops his fruit, he doesn't know how to eat his hamburger or whatever it is. He doesn't know how to wear his clothes. Look at him, he's uncouth. It happened to the Turks in the 7th and the 8th century. So the Arabs used to look down upon the Berbers, and the Berbers resented it. Secondly, the Berbers were an independent people. They did not want to pay taxes. The city dwellers were used to taxation because they derived some benefits from it. The, the, the dwellers of the mountains, they derived very few benefits. It happens today, too. Where do the taxes come from in, in the United States? Many of the taxes go from Los Angeles and San Francisco and New York to Washington, D.C. And where does it get spent in the rural areas? Let me look at it in a broad sense. I'm just sort of bringing it to, to the, uh, to the uh, present. So that tension made it possible for the conquistadores, the Christians, to play off one group of Muslims 
against the other. One was the principalities in Spain, headed by various tribes fighting amongst themselves. The other was the tension between the Berbers and the Arabs, and to a lesser extent, the, the uh, dwellers of the uh, sub-Saharan Africans. So one after the other, these principalities begin to fall. So you ask yourself, why did they fall? They fell because they were unable to work together as they did for 300 years for a transcendental goal. They lost their faith in the transcendental goal. When you study human history, you find the following. So you can start from the fundamentals. The basic is the individual. We all have egos. Every one of them has egos. We don't want to surrender that ego. Then the next unit that we have is a family. Within the family, you have ego play. Goes on all the time. But you give up some of the ego for the family to work. Then you have the extended family. Then beyond that, you have the community. Then beyond that, you have the nation. And beyond the nation, you have the humankind. Islam draws the largest boundary because it speaks of humankind. By submitting your ego to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by submitting to the principle of Tawheed, what you have done is to surrender your ego, the autonomy that God has given you for a higher purpose. When that does not happen, there is conflict. The other place where it happens is that as you expand the, the, the domain of the ego, when you start surrendering some of the autonomy that God has given you, you stop at, say, the level of your group, whether it be a religious group or a national group, conflict arises. Why do religions fight? Why do, for instance, the Christians and the Muslims and the Hindus and the Buddhists, why do they fight? Because they use religion to define their identity. When you use religion to define your identity, conflict, conflict emerges. When religion transcends identity, as it happens with Tawheed, then you have the beginning of the civilization. I hope you're still with me. These are very important ideas. Religions divide when they're used to define identity. When they're used to transcend that identity, they bring humanity together. Ya ayyun nasu rabbakumul ladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us not just the ayahs, but the explanations. And then these signs are there in history. Spain fell apart, number one, because they lost their faith. Number two, because they had become city dwellers, used to the absence of virtue, let's call it, that Ibn Khaldun talks about. Then, there was because of the conflict, there were other reasons as well the absence of money. I said earlier, in order for political consolidation to, to take place, you need energy, you need money. For a long time, the wealth of Spain provided that energy for the Mawrid to hold off the conquistadores. But as Spain fell gradually, the means of support, the tax revenues from Spain disappeared so that North Africa which is not as fertile as the Andalusian Peninsula, was left to its own, own wits. They tried trade. They said, we're going to trade with the Italians. The Italians were coming up, Genoa, um, and some of the city-states of uh, Venice. Venice. They were coming up at the time. They signed these trade deals with them, but the trade deals worked to the advantage of only a few rich people in the, in the uh, Mediterranean seaboard. The tax revenues did not accrue to the emirs. The emirs were paupers. They were not able to finance campaigns in Spain. They were not able to hold off the onslaught of Europe because, remember, when the crusade was declared, all of the kings and noblemen of Europe were duty-bound by papal edict 
to support the conquistadors. So the Christian side contained not just the Spaniards and the Portuguese, it contained the French and the Germans and the English and the Italians, all of them. Whereas the Muslim side was gradually losing it, losing the base, losing their monetary and financial uh, ability to uh, hold off the Christian onslaught. That was the third reason. Lastly, if you really ask yourself, how could a great civilization like, the, like that to fall apart? In my opinion, it must go back to faith. And one has to ask ourselves, why do lose, people lose their faith? You know, we can apply it today also. Why do Muslims, why are Muslims in the state that they're in? I would submit that it is because of the lack of faith. Now, people speak of faith as if it is something that is said by the tongue, and once you say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, faith. True, that's the beginning. But faith means the consequences of faith, a tawhidic civilization. Meaning, you have to surrender your ego to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is Islam, surrender. Of course, there are multiple meanings of it. You have to surrender and be able to work together for a transcendent goal. Why is there so much fighting in Syria? So many people, Muslims, fighting each other. In Iraq, Shia Sunnis. You, you, no matter which country you mention, these schisms that I mentioned earlier, the cracks internally, the Islamic civilization has come apart. The transcendent faith of Tawheed, of Illalladina Amanu, if there was that Amanu, if there was that certainty of faith, people would not fight. People would say, okay, we have differences of opinion as existed in the time of the Sahaba. But they would not fight. And you see that fighting in small groups and in large groups. And people ask me, for instance, well, you know, why aren't we like, for instance, the Jewish people? Good question. I have seen the Jewish people. I admire them. You know, when you sit in the gatherings internally in a room, there's hot debate. They disagree. And they disagree point by point, sometimes vigorous debate. But when they come out of the room, they speak with one voice. It is important to know the difference between disagreement and fighting. You know, we look at Pakistan, we look at Bangladesh and Pakistan, we look at India. I've narrated to you in parts of Uttar Pradesh in India, small town, two Khabrastans. Muslims don't even want to be buried in the same graveyard. Would you believe? Yeah. And recently there was an election, 20% of the population of Uttar Pradesh is Muslim, any place where they had a reasonable chance of getting elected, four or five candidates, Muslim candidates. No, they don't agree. We need to get back to faith. Spain was lost because the faith became weak and the fissiferous tendencies, the cracks, the Shia Sunni cracks, the Fatimid uh, Sunni cracks, the Abbasid and uh, the uh, um, Umayyad cracks, the cracks between the city dwellers and the mountain dwellers and the pasture land, the Africans and the white Arabs, the cracks were there. And these cracks enabled outsiders to gradually overcome the resistance of the Muslims. That, in a nutshell, is the story of Spain. Marvelous civilization that was the jewel of Spain. Cordoba at one time had one million people. It was so far advanced that it had flown water, paved streets, street lamps, 1,000 mosques, 1,000 libraries. Even ordinary people had 50,000, 100,000 books. The Khalifa had 500,000 books when the largest monastery in Europe had only 13 books, and some places 19 books. 19 books, 
500,000 books came apart. So we need to go back to the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I end the way I started. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Well, us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath. He's not just emphasis, he takes an oath on what time, throughout time, which we don't understand. Well, us, then emphasis is inna, second time, inna the insana, Christ, everybody, not just Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, everybody, inna the insana. Then the third time of emphasis, la, is also an emphasis. Third emphasis, three times. Highest, middle level. First, you lose, except. Must have that certainty of faith. It's, it's good to disagree. Good to have debate. You see that in the Islamic centers, 80% of the Islamic centers in North America are rental centers, but these, these kinds of things. It's good to disagree, but once you have a structure, once you have a person who, has, who is authorized to do something, support him, support her. Support. Do good deeds. That is the key. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word, uses the word tawasa twice. Tawasa comes from the word wasa. As I related to you the last time, it means connection. Like you take an atom, it has those bonds, the connections, the various forces within the atom. It's the same thing with an individual. An individual has bonds with a family, father, mother, wife, husband, children, grandchildren, neighbors, Community, these bonds. You must reinforce those bonds. Tawasa bil haq for what? See, that's a powerful thing. Bil haq. One can talk about haq for generations. It's the name of God. It's justice. It's truth. It's science. It's technology. It's good deeds. For haq. Stand for haq. Working together for what is just for everyone. Tawasa bil haq. But tawasa bil sab. And not just once. Continuously, from the moment you are born till the moment you die, it's a continuous struggle. So now, it should give us some idea of what happened in Spain. Some idea of what has been happening in the Islamic world all the time. What is happening, more importantly, to the Islamic world today. And if you want to apply it in America, By the grace of Allah, the Islamic community in America is a melting pot. It is a situation that even the greatest of awliyaullah did not have the benefit of. That is, the ingathering of people from all corners of the globe. For what? For the sake of haq, for the sake of justice justice for all, for the sake of certainty of faith, for the sake of doing good deeds, ihsan, for the sake of doing beautiful deeds, and not for the sake of being divided on the basis of people in introduce themselves. I'm a Shia, I'm a Sunni. I haven't talked about the schisms amongst the Sunnis, the Mutazalites we covered, and then we'll talk about the the uh, Muraditum revolution another time, and then the uh, various different schools of fiqh, and then we have the right wing, the uh, Wahhabis, and left wing, whatever we want to call them, Sufis, whatever. So many different schisms that we have, except the one that we should keep, mm -hmm. which is to be a Muslim, to surrender oneself to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to work together for justice. For good deeds. And that's the challenge before the Islamic community in America. I have avoided going into specific details of dates and so on, but it's more important to understand the, the global picture as to how it happened and why it happened, what lessons can we draw, because he keeps saying there are signs in there. 
Science and history. Read the science. Read history not as in the year 1031, the Khilafat in uh, Spain fell apart, or 1212, the Battle of uh, Los, Las Novas de Tolosa, the Muslims lost out, and 1236, Khatabah fell, 1240, 1292, they were expelled, not as dates. But ask, what is the lesson here? What is the sign? What is the sign in the appearance of Islam in America? What lessons can we draw? That must always be our goal, to use history, to learn, to grow, so that we become worthy when we appear before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment, we become worthy of being presented to Him through our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, a few moments for questions. Was it how was the presentation? Was it easy? <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned that uh, Indonesia and Malaysia kind of operated uh, uh, in isolation. Um, did they have uh, an association with any of the, the caliphates specifically? Uh, association with? With the caliphates to their west? Or did well, they have their own individual? No, they all question. owed. The question is, it was mentioned that the uh, Indonesians and Malaysians, the Malay people, face their destiny by themselves in relative isolation. And the question is, did they owe their allegiance to the Khilafat? Yes, they did. However, when I use the term, I mean politically, militarily, okay. the distance and the separation by ocean necessitated, made it, made it imperative that they faced whatever the face, their challenges, more or less in isolation, even more so than the Maghrib. Maghrib was isolated, but there was at least some connection, land connection, with Egypt. But uh, the uh, Malay people had less of it. Inshallah, we'll have a session on Islam in Malaysia, uh, and then we'll have a session also on Islam in India, and Pakistan and Bangladesh, and each one of them was a specific application of this uh, spread of Islam, how it did, and how it did not, uh, and so on. Yes? Um, so, I, I'm surprised to know that um, the Maghreb was primarily um, Shia, because you said they were ruled by the Fatimids, right? The Maghreb was ruled by the Fatimids, yeah. but the Maghreb was not Shia. The population was Sunni, and it was for that reason that after an initial attempt at conversion, especially during the time of Mu'iz, and then at the time of uh, uh, Al-Hakim, who was uh, somewhat nuts in his head, uh, in the beginning of the 11th century, they gave up that effort, and they established a working relationship with the Sunnis. And that's the reason why the Karamatians from Karamat they split off and they said, we don't want to work with the Sunnis at all. So then how did uh, that area become the Fatimid dynasty, but then the Umayyads were just like isolated on, in Spain? Like, how did they pass through? How did they get there? Who, the Umayyads? The Umayyads? Yeah. The Umayyads were there. The Umayyad dynasty was established. They were the initial conquerors. In the, during the Umayyad period, if you recall, Tariq and Musa, when they conquered Spain, that happened at the time of the Umayyads. And then when the Abbasid revolution took place in 750, one of the Umayyad princes, Abdurrahman I, managed to escape, went to Spain, was welcomed, and that remained Sunni and under the control of the Umayyads. Whereas North Africa politically, militarily, came under the sway of the Fatimids, but the population remained Sunni. Were any of the Western powers, so-called whatever power they had at that time, involved in any of these getting Muslims to fight? The, the Western powers were the, was the, was the Pope. Crusade. The authority was the Pope. And at that time, uh, all of Europe was Catholic. Protestant revolution had not taken place as yet. So when the Pope gave an edict, 
then everybody was duty bound to fight the uh, Muslims, the conquistadors, so called, those the Spaniards. But in addition to the Spaniards, you had the French and the Germans and the Italians and the and the city states and sometimes the English knights. All of them were involved. They were not the powers in the sense that we understand today, because Europe was still they, in, the, in its dark ages. It was before the uh, Crusades, or during the Crusades. They were way behind civilizationally, the Muslims, except that they were all together in their confrontation during the Crusades with the Muslims. Follow-up question? So when Muslims were ruling Spain, how successful were they to kind of intrude Islam into the local Spaniards over there? The Seems question like is, not great. when the Muslims were ruling Spain, uh, how prevalent was Islam in Spain? For, for the local Spaniards? Yes, for the Spaniards. The, the chroniclers say that at the time of Abdurrahman III, which is in the latter part of the 10th century, 60% of Spain, Spaniards, was Muslim. The Spaniards had accepted Islam in droves starting with the 8th century until the uh, end of the um, 10th century. Then it gradually starts to regress. So much so, sometimes we read the uh, uh, bishops complaining, for instance, that their priests are more interested in learning Arabic than in learning Latin because uh, you know, they, they were going to the Muslim uh, madrasas and then universities and then gradually change their, their faith too. That happened. So that's, that's the answer. 60% of Spain was Muslim. Did the Russian play any part? Did Russia any was not, not at all in this book. The Russians do not come into play on the world stage until after the time of Time of Lame. Time of Lame was the, around the year 1400. Until that time, most of Russia was under the thumb of the Tatars. And Tamerlane liberated Moscow and surrounding areas from the Tatars. And if you want to use the term loosely, the founder of modern Russia, it was Tamerlane in the year 1400. From then on, that's way after these wars that we are talking about. No, Russia does not enter into the world game until the time of Peter the they call him Peter the Great, but Peter in the 17th century or so, when they consolidated and expanded. The Uls, uh, also from Tamil land. That's much later. We'll cover that. The Mughals were 1526 onwards. We are talking about 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th century. Islam had not even entered India at the time. Are you going to talk about, or is there any value uh, in talking about how Muslims are? completely eradicated from Spain in the end, and what happened to them? Basically, the, the how were the Muslims eradicated, completely eradicated mm -hmm. from Spain? When the Muslims surrendered Ramada in 1492, the terms of surrender guaranteed freedom of religion for the Muslims. But no sooner had the ink dried on the paper that it was written on, first the Jews were expelled in 1492. And five years later, the Inquisition was instituted against the Muslims. Inquisition. Either accept Christianity or death. And to force the Muslims, they took the children, put them into Catholic schools. They would deny people water so that they could not do pollution. And torture was used too. And the, there was uh, resistance, but uh, there was no political it went on until the year 1609. There were many uprisings, and each time they were put down ruthlessly. Uh, that's how it happened, through the Inquisition. When we use the word Sp Spanish Inquisition, indeed the Spanish Inquisition was instituted as far away as India. When 1507, the Portuguese captured Goa, they instituted the Inquisition in Goa, and they recorded uh, chronicles. Indian sources that speak of how the, it's not just the Muslims, the Hindus also were subjected to Inquisition. You mentioned that, uh, and indeed, if I may point out, 
in Bengal, they tried the Portuguese went to Bengal, in Chittagong, for instance, they tried to institute uh, the, uh, the uh, Inquisition. At that time, Shah Jahan, it was the year about 1640, he heard of it, and he had them capture the Portuguese and brought to Agra and paraded through Agra. This is all recorded through histories of Parishta and others too. Went on on. Um, so, it, it Spain, it was the Spaniards in Spain, locals, 60% Muslim. Was that also augmented by, by Berbers who stayed after they came to assist? So well, that's a good a question. Number? I do not know the breakdown. When they say 60%, I assume that included all of them. Because only a small number of Arabs went into these lands. Yeah? Arabia did not have a huge population. Historically, people estimate that Spain probably had 3 million people mm. at the time, maybe. So, when we say 60%, we include everybody. Okay. Any other questions from the ladies? Yes? Yeah. Uh, either now or maybe at another time, if you could talk about, because the focus is history, science, and Islam, so history, science, and faith, if you can talk about some of the um, scientific achievements, technology, and so on. Yes, yeah, maybe I'll cover it the next time. Go into it. Spain. It, what's astonishing to me as a student of history is the. Yeah. What's astonishing to me is that when you look at the scientific achievements in the Islamic world, most of them, not all of them, most of them um, come about, happen either in the Far East in Khorasan, which is a Persianized part of the Islamic world, or in Spain. Amazing. Similar to the observation that we'll make later, the, the queens, the Muslim queens that we have, were primarily outside of the Arab core. Were there historical reasons for it? Were there doctrinal reasons for it? Razia Sultan, except for Shajarat al Durr, who in the 13th century, African queens we have, Indonesian queens we have, Indian Pakistani queens we have, very few in the Arab. So that's something to, to think about as to why what happened. Yes. Um, can you give us more details about the, the, uh, the robbery of the black stones? And, and yes. I'm surprised because I thought it was lodged into the building of the cabin. Well, they stole it. They took it. They, like they chiseled it out? The like sack, yes. The sack, Maka. Huh. Chiseled it out. Not chiseled it out. Took it out. And then cut it cut it out. Oh. And kidnapped the stone. Took it to Bahrain. For 20 years. Was that. They were extremists. They were, they were ruthless people. When you see what is happening in the world today, extremely when they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says very clearly that he does not love the extremists. Inna allaha la yuhibbu mu'tadeen. That's the Quran. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love those who exceed the bounds. Allah does not love the extremists. They were extremists. They were horrible people. So the Christians, uh, particularly the Muslims, between the fall of Spain in basically 1492, led by a um, Catholic Charles, right? When you go to the interfaith um, meetings, right? When you explain to them, or if somebody asks you, maybe I just want to know the current <coughs> Catholic Charles, what is the review of, uh, of Christian Muslim at that time? I mean, do you have the same? Uh, it, the same the question is, in interfaith gatherings, how do we present it? Um, in interfaith gatherings, you know, every piece of knowledge has a place. You don't share, for instance, certain types of knowledge. For instance, the knowledge of the soul, you don't talk to people who don't know what soul is. I'm talking about Muslims, I'm not talking about... The interfaith, the purpose of the interfaith is to generate camaraderie, to, to, to generate mutual understanding. There we talk about how Spain created a composite cosmopolitan culture and civilization in which the Muslims, Christians, and the Jews all participated. Very cosmopolitan. And all avenues of participation in science, culture, arts, 
language were open to all the communities. That was one reason why so many Spaniards accepted Islam. Mm -hmm. So that's what we talk about. So when we are in an interfaith uh, gathering, what I talk about is the composite culture. Very rarely has it happened in human history until recent times that three, these three major faiths have worked together so well, so harmoniously, for 700 years. Except for the conflicts that we talked about. We, we focused on how Spain was lost. We have not talked about the civilization of Spain, which was a very composite, advanced civilization, composite and uh, urban, <coughs> in which uh, Christians, Jews, and Muslims all participated. That's what we should focus on. One last question. A comment. <coughs> was the presentation too terse, or was it reasonably clear? Yeah. Yeah. Inshallah. So next week, uh, uh, take a note of the fact that uh, there's a question about the scientific achievements. We've got so much to talk about. But I will shift the focus to the Mongol devastations and the Crusades that took place at the same time. What people don't understand is these two events, these two uh, onslaughts took place at the same time. So we'll focus on it next week. We have about eight weeks left, inshallah. The important thing today was to note down the laws of civilization. What makes it possible? Those are the keys, and, and focus on those, understand them, reflect on them in the light of the Quran, and then you'll come up with your own solution to modern day problems. Inshallah.